Okay. All right, well, um, thank you uh, to everyone who's come here and for the patience. I think we always have to, no matter where you are on the planet, you have to pay homage to technology. Um, it's very common in many places. What I thought I would do would be to start off with um, uh, a little bit of an overview of, of coral reefs and, and the, the sort of challenges that we're seeing. And then Sophie will come in and talk about uh, what those reefs might look like in the future. Uh, and then I'll come back and then talk about this initiative that Gabriel mentioned, the 50 Reefs Project, uh, which has sparked a lot of debate, and I think that's uh, a good sign in that it is something we need to digest uh, uh, very solidly in this regard. Um, but before I begin, I really want to pay um, to say how grateful we are to the uh, government of the Maldives, the NRC, IUCN, and the university for allowing us to not only do research here, but also to come talk to you today. So um, here's what I thought uh, we would talk about. Um, firstly, this is an overview of coral reefs. Um, a little bit about the value of coral reefs for people. Um, that often gets lost uh, to a lot of people that are in charge of reefs. You know, that, you know, really the value of coral reefs is really underestimated in many cases. So no. And then I want to talk about this threat of climate change to that value. Uh, and talk particularly about what happened last year on the Great Barrier Reef and in the Maldives here. Uh, and it's quite shocking what happened. And it's, I think, sounding a warning bell that we need to fight even harder to decarbonize uh, our, our way of doing things. Um, and then uh, Sophie, as I said, will come in and talk about really uh, projections of future change. And what she's been doing with um, our students and postdocs is recreating the future uh, in mesocosms. And this really is a sort of litmus test. What happens when you warm and acidify um, coral reefs uh, growing over years? What happens to them in the end? Uh, and I won't spoil her thunder. And but it's not very nice to look at what she creates. Um, and then I have to come back and say, well, this is great. Um, we're now really frightened about what the future might hold. What do we do about this? What does Paris, for example, mean in terms of the Paris Climate Agreement? And what should we be doing, uh, I think, in terms of the management of these reef systems as we go forward into a future which is going to be even more challenging uh, than they are today? Well, just to remind you, and for those people that may not have studied coral reefs per se, Coral reefs are a phenomenon of the tropical regions of the planet. And they occur where you have temperatures that are quite warm, you have a lot of sunlight, um, the uh, water is quite alkaline, and you've got sort of substrate within the surface of the ocean. And if you have those conditions, you end up with uh, coral reefs. And of course, completely in context, I've been vlogging this picture of the Maldives forever. It's one of the most uh, you know, one of the most important reef systems on, on the planet. So of course, when you look at a coral reef, it's teeming with life. It's not just the corals that are important. Um, in terms of the habitat, it's actually quite a rare habitat. It's less than 0.1% of the Earth's surface is covered by coral reefs. But despite that, one in every four ocean fish species live uh, in and around the coral reef. But really important in terms of that structure, for all those other species. Um, they're economically important for businesses and communities across 100 countries, and they provide important subsistence resources for at least 500 million people across the planet. So um, they're not just a dive destination. These are really crucially important in terms of biology and human systems. Well, one of the things that I've been involved in with a bunch of economists from something called the Boston Consulting Group is to see if you can't put a dollar value on coral reefs. So you sort of go, okay, well, you can do that with fisheries, and you know, we know that they attract a certain amount of tourism. Of course, that's really important for more reefs. Um, they do other stuff, like sand, maintain water quality, and so on. But can we get uh, a measure of this? And the number is quite um, interesting. So if you just take coral reefs, I should say that if you take the entire ocean, there's an asset value of $24 trillion, 
which is like your big bank balance or your, your capex, as they say in economics. That capex of $24 trillion generates $2.4 trillion of value for humans. Now, within that, if you take coral reefs, you find that there's a trillion dollar asset that we have of, which is called coral reefs. And off that comes a dividend each year of somewhere between three and four hundred billion. Now, I caution you, this is um, an absolute minimum because we can't, uh, we, we don't really have a way of estimating the dollar value of the sand that coral is produced or the importance to culture that coral is produced. All those things are extra. So this is an absolute minimum number. And when you look at the ocean, it's actually the seventh largest economy in the world. So it's this huge, um, important asset. And of course, these systems seem to be robust. They go back millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. And of course, there has been an assumption, I think, with humans that, well, coral reefs can take anything. You can throw anything at them and they'll kind of keep on bouncing back. And of course, in, you know, we shouldn't be even worried. And of course, you know the answer to that. I don't think you can live in the world even not, and not realize that we really do have a big challenge here. And the same in Australia. Um, the Great Barrier Reef, one of the most protected reef systems on the planet, has lost 50% of its corals in the last 30 years. So these are the sort of, you know, challenging aspects. So why are reefs disappearing? Well, um, I should say there's plenty of papers out there that are long-term studies that are showing these trends. These are four papers that you can pull out and look at those long-term trends and see them all going down. And the reason for that, that, that decline, up until really recently, has been pollution, overfishing, and physical destruction, so coastal development and so on. They've been the major drivers of distress of coral reefs. But in the last 20 years, we've seen them really one of the first um, examples uh, of a climate change uh, impact appearing within coral reefs. And that's really where I'm going to focus, and, and again, Sophie will talk about this when she gets up to speak, is about this issue of ocean warming and acidification. Those things now are much greater signals than the local effects. That doesn't mean that local effects are not important, they become actually crucial in terms of building resilience against climate change. But we are in a day and age where, for example, in Australia last year, we lost the same number of corals as we lost in, in 30 years. I mean, this is happening right here and now. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we've discovered in our collaboration here in the Morbid. So, one of the most overt signs of climate change on coral reefs is that they turn a brilliant white color. And that's due to the fact that there's a symbiosis between a dinoflagellate, a tiny algal cell, and corals that is responsible for them being able to build reefs and house that biodiversity and provide all those sort of benefits to humans. Now, that brown symbiont under good average conditions on a coral reef is there and it attracts sunlight and so on and so forth. But on the conditions of just a little bit warmer than normal, so it's one to two degrees above the summer maximum temperature for a region, and you drive coral reefs into a state where they dump all those symbionts, and they don't they no longer have that food source or that energy source for laying down calcium carbonate and building reefs. And so this is one that happened in 2006 on the Great Barrier Reef. We had 50% of the reef that bleached during that time. Uh, fortunately, we only lost about 5 to 10% of, of the corals on the reef. And of course, we don't really know that number well enough because uh, we weren't able to be surveying at that scale. Um, I think Great Barrier is twice the size of, of the Maldives in terms of its stretch. So it's a really big system. Well, so we lose these symbionts. Uh, it seems to be stress. What's causing that problem, per se? And it's now unambiguous and, and, and not able to be really argued through the alternative. And that is it's all about small amounts of temperature change on coral reefs. And this is uh, the top panel there is 1998 in Australia when we had 50% of the bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. That 
yellow and orange is somewhere between one and uh, perhaps two um, uh, degrees above the average. And if you interact that signal, you can get a dose response. And associated with that was this huge impact on, on, on corals. In 2002, uh, we had a smaller scale event on the, oh sorry, we had a, a similar scale event uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see this one is going from our, the beginning of summer through to the end of summer. And you can see that really warm water impacting. So there's a very good um, correlation between mass coral bleaching and mortality and temperature. So at this point, I'm going to just mention this, and Sophie will pick up on it because her experiments include acidification. It's not only the temperature changing that's causing problems for coral, for coral reefs. It's also due to the fact that CO2 in increasing in the atmosphere is more and more going into the ocean. So we're getting um, CO2 pouring into the ocean at very high rates. That's causing the ocean to become slightly more acidic. And that's changing the ability of corals and other organisms to um, to form their skeletons. And at the same time, it's making it easier for a lot of organisms called decalcifiers to start to dissolve that, 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 that skeleton. So I'm not going to talk any more about this, but it's an equally important issue uh, with coral reefs. So what about the future? Um, this is a prediction um, which I put together many, many years ago uh, in 1999, where I did a very simple thing. I just took mm. the output of climate models for ocean temperature for particular regions. Here we've got Tahiti, Phuket, and the south coast of Jamaica. And I plotted a line in each of those regions for where I was simulating these changes in temperature for the known tolerance of corals. So if you like, I know the temperature at which they uh, respond to heat and bleach. So if I then say nothing changes, then what happens to temperature over time? And the message is that um, corals are thrown into ocean conditions that they can't stand on a regular basis, on an annual basis, by the middle of the century. If we continue to push CO2 into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels and land use temperatures. Okay, so one of the awful parts of my career has to see that prediction come true. And in fact, last year, it became quite shockingly true. And this is the Great Barrier Reef, um, the northern section, which is 800 kilometers long. That section of the Great Barrier Reef had been, um, had avoided a lot of damage from bleaching in the past. So we were starting to make up all these hypotheses about why that was. It was, it's less impacted by human factors, there's not a lot of agriculture, not a lot of pollution, and all these sort of ideas were moving around until late December. 2015, when temperatures shot up in the northern Great Barrier Reef. And we went from having reefs that bleached extensively up to 100% on, on particular reefs, then experiencing mortalities that were around 35% of all corals on the reef. So one in every three corals died. And if you did that for the entire Great Barrier Reef, it was one in every four corals, four to five corals that died. So that's a lot of death and destruction if you think of the Great Barrier Reef, of course, being so large. So one of the aspects of this, this is shocking, but are there reefs that did do better than others? Or, you know, if you look at those sites there, are they representative of, of the entire system? And this is where um, our group has designed and implemented, uh, with the help of a major insurance company, uh, a way of surveying coral reefs at vast scales and analyzing the images we get with image recognition and machine learning and artificial intelligence so that we can do things at a speed that's probably a thousand times faster than we've done in the past. And one of the key postdocs on this is a chap called Manuel Gonzalez Rivera, 
who took up this challenge along with some others in the lab as well. And there's a lot of PhD students involved in this. And started to work on how we could take technologies that were maturing and develop a system where we could do this sort of large scale surveys to look at the damage that was occurring to the Great Barrier Reef. Remembering that, I, I don't know how many of some of you have, I know. But remembering that we can only really do about 150 quadrants or square meter uh, transects per dive. So if we're only doing two or three dives a day, it's a very, we cannot accumulate information very, very fast. With this, we can do two kilometers along the reef press, generate 900 photographs, and put them into this system, and it will spit out how much coral cover and what sort of coral it was, and a whole bunch of different things. So we can get information at a really large scale. So um, this led to this particular instrument, uh, which is the SV2. And there was a fellow called Richard Leavis, who wasn't a scientist who came up with this. Uh, his mission as a marketer was to uh, get people to understand what coral reefs are going through by taking them on a 3D experience. So you know Google Street View? Uh, he came up with underwater street view. So you can actually go and dive different places in there. This camera turned out to be absolutely fantastic for uh, surveying the bottom of the ocean. And I, and I don't know if it's a word. So that wasn't dark data, if you were wondering. Well, we did three sets of surveys, um, uh, around about 50,000 images that were collected uh, in 2012, 2014, and 2016. And this massive bleaching event in 2016 occurred between 2014 and 2016. So we're able to actually look at a time when we didn't have a stress event from 2012 to 2014. But then to look at a, the, the influence of an event that happened between 2014 and 2016. Now, not all of the change is due to uh, a temperature change, not due to bleaching event, because we're looking at a period of time of about two years. But the most likely explanation for the massive amount of change we saw uh, is that bleaching event. So it's really accumulating disturbances because also during this period there were two um, cyclones. And so we set out um, an experimental program that went up and down the reef, these are the sites. Um, we took all of these images, thousands of them, and then we developed a system from, again, I say we, it was the brilliance of the lab, I was just there, the spokesperson. But what you got at the end was a system where if you look at that bottom graph there, um, the perception of a human, I'm uh, sorry, the machine was mimicking a human very accurately. So we, we could do things at a thousand times uh, as fast as a human, but with the same accuracy. So you've got the system now, which then allows you to really start to look at large scale change. We have 41 functional categories. So that's uh, coral, no coral, sand, soft coral, other benthic life forms, and so on. Uh, and then out of that, then, this system was taken. I think it's now more than 22 countries. There's a team here that will correct me, I'm sure. But it's something like 22, 24 uh, countries, and a 1,000 kilometers of reef that have been actually explored. Um, and so here are some of the results of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, this is the amount of coral. So on the 
bottom axis here, you've got um, the amount of coral on, 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 on reefs, and then you've got um, the difference, sorry, it's the difference between 2014 and 2012. And you can see that the mean is really sort of sitting on a little bit below um, zero. So in that time, there wasn't a really major change in coral color. But if you had the comparison between 2016 and 2014, you saw a massive change in the average coral cover on reefs. And the explanation there is that there was this thermal impact. And there's a report on this if you want to look into it. But basically, um, the major disturbance was the bleaching. So it's removing quite a lot of coral. So so 32% of corals in these sensitive communities have been removed. What we also saw with high precision was that as coral and soft corals declined, we also got an increase in the algae. So as you remove corals from reefs, as you probably all know, algae come in. So that made a lot of sense as well. And as I said, the major effect was due to thermal stress over here. This is basically um, you know, the amount of warming over time. But these two cyclones enabled us to sort of petition out an effective cyclone. Do, do cyclones have the same effect as, as uh, mass coral bleaching? And I think the evidence is really quite compelling. So if you take the first period, in regions that were outside where the cyclones had an effect, there was a normal sort of growth that was going on. But if you were in the area close to one of these cyclones, in this case I think it was, you had a decrease in coral, uh, coral cover. If you then start to consider just bleaching alone, when it occurred in the next period, you can see it's a much larger effect than the cyclone effect. But if you then add a cyclone on top of the bleaching, you get an extra impact as well. So there's a really strong case for a very significant cyclone effect. And of course here you've got bleaching in two cyclones and storms are starting to look like, in this particular case, uh, are starting to rival that of temperature. And so as we go forward with warmer seas and greater storm strengths, unfortunately the Maldives is outside the, the, the cyclone and hurricane belt, but in other parts of the world there's going to be an increasing impact, I think, of, of storms on, on coral reefs. So, that was the Great Barrier Reef. Was there any reason to be worried about other places? Well, of course, that's the leading um, question here. And that is, of course, that in 2016, events similar to the Great Barrier Reef happened in Maldives. And you can see here, this is a measure of stress. You can see the Maldives over there that are bathed in sort of yellowy colors, somewhat similar to the Northern Great Barrier Reef. So what happened in the Maldives? And fortunately, uh, we've been collaborating and done with the first survey prior to this event, that's in 2015. And so we're coming back this year to go and look at what's happened since those, those events. And I've seen a lot of your country. Fantastic. I want to stay here. I don't know whether I get a, a visa or something, but it's, it's so beautiful. But under the water, there's been some very big changes. And we haven't got them analyzed. We've got the boat this morning. Um, but these are the sites where we've been to both. Uh, we've surveyed in 2015 and again in 2017. Now, I have to introduce the, the, the amazing group of people that were on this uh, team. Some of them, like Pete, have been to those 22 countries. Personally, Don. Um, knows everybody, I think, in the Maldives. Hmm? And in the world. Apparently, you can go into any place and ask for Dominic Bryant and he'll and it's all done. Who knows Dominic Bryant? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but this group has been out for the last two weeks. It's also been working on some of the oceanography around uploading uh, signals and so on. Um, also looking at algal coral interactions but also then redoing all of these uh, transect sites to see what the effect of that, that impact has been. And unfortunately, this is the sort of typical photograph that we've been seeing. 
expensive diver is probably peaked going across the, uh, the substrate uh, at about a meter, a meter high. You can see that most, you know, if you can see some varieties there, there's probably a fossil opera, uh, something over there. But overall, there's a lot of missing uh, coral. Now, we know from 1998, when a similar thing happened, that coral bounced back really quickly. It was about 10, 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years, we started to see, uh, you know, that beauty start to reflourish. But the problem is that we're, uh, even though we had the big warming last year, we've already got warming building up right now in this region. And I was just told by Gabrielle that it was reaching in 2015 as well. So we're getting the point in that prediction where we're starting to poke up into uh, a situation where we're going to have multiple years where we have more conditions to more. That's uh, going to put a lot of uh, challenges out there in terms of, of this. And this is sort of the visual. This is from a uh, site in April 2015. And this is sort of what we saw in a, you know, in a, close, a site close to We've seen this massive uh, difference in, in, in health. Um, as I say, we haven't been able to really analyze these results. We're going to make them available uh, in September uh, as a sort of a survey. Um, you know, as I say, it's quite a large number of sites that will have that information available. We talk about the idea that this could be a very important GIS layer um, for trying to understand change in this region. So the other impressions are that the similar mass mortality has occurred here as occurred in Australia. Um, of course, not everything is completely decimated. There are some places you come across where new recruits, little baby coral, will start to grow again. Uh, this is what happened in 1998. Almost immediately, you start to see this bounce back. But it looks like fewer areas are in that position. There's a lot of areas that don't have anything in the, in, in the form of recruits. Some varieties, there are corals that are tougher than others, and there is clear signs that they've done better. So as we go through these data, we'll probably see that the varieties are sort of staying and even growing, but the others are dropping away. Um, as I said, there's a report uh, there. So it's now time for me to give this to Professor Dow, who will show you a little bit about... Oh, so much, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Been one of those days. That's okay. it. So, I'm just going to move on. What we wanted, when we, we started the whole set of experiments about six years ago, and we wanted to provide experimental data to support a lot of the modeling data. So you take Oates paper of 1999, you know, there were these projections of what reefs would look like in the future. But there wasn't hard physical evidence of that fact. And a lot of people were like suspicious of models. So we wanted some hard to experimental data, and so this is what these sets of experiments were set about achieving. Also, you know, just now we've seen what happens in an El Nino event, but we also want you to understand what will happen in baseline years of the future, non El Nino events. Yeah? So this is the recovery years of you, if you like, when El Nino's are happening. And our experiments were funded by NOAA, uh, the National Oceanographic Administration of the US. And they have all these algorithms for predicting reaching, and they were interested in sort of future proofing those algorithms. So part of our study involved that. And the other thing we wanted to think at was what happened to the net classification rates of reefs. If you look at the reef and it's bleached, but we don't really know what it has the classification rate stored, or is it still going along, or, or is it actually now declining in that state? So we want to give some of those ideas. So I've talked a lot about some baseline temperatures and things like that. You know, so the temperatures we use when we talk about reaching events, and they're pretty vaguely used also, you know, heating above average. What do we mean by average? Okay. So I thought I'd go over some of them. Uh, it helps, hopefully in the age of, if you do look at the NOAA virtual station sites, that you understand a bit about how they work. And also, if you're going to conduct experiments yourself, 
<laughs> if you think about what temperature you're heating from, you know, are you heating from winter temperatures and adding four? Are you taking an average mean temperature for the whole year? Or well, where do you want to heat from? Okay? So when we talk about temperatures, we talk about this maximum monthly mean, the MMA. Okay? And that's basically the average temperature of the hottest month for the sea temperature. And no, when they do it, they go back to a window in time. You know, it's an average of what time frame. They go back to 1985 through uh, 93. And they drop out in 91 and 92 because of that for the uh, And so that's very important because that sets that threshold. So if they start using other satellites, um, it's important that they correct the factors. So we're talking about the same and then they I would mention this word hotspots. You know, what is a hotspot? A hotspot is basically when the temperature goes above MMA. Okay? And a hotspot then starts to accumulate into this other figure that they call the DHW, the degree heating week. And that's basically taking how hot it is above MMA multiplied by how long it stays there. Yes? So we get these DHWs and they work on the rolling 12 week window. And based on that, NOAA predicts possibility of reaching, reaching likely, and then mortality likely. Okay, so we put to the HW of greater than eight, we're supposed to start seeing weeks. So part of NOAA were interested in, you know, have they got these numbers right? Yes. Or do we need to introduce things like light to understand some of our reaching events and to get more? And then they produced these graphs, and this is one of the more these. Okay, this is one that's surprising us at the moment because if you look at the bleaching event in 2016 over the top there, it doesn't look that hot. But when we see the damage from our reason, it looks much greater. And so we can discuss it amongst ourselves and we think there's some issues with MNN this site, for instance, to keep in mind. And you can see here that coming 2017, we've got that heating accelerating. Okay, so the dash line is at an end, the reaching threshold is one above that. So we wanted to teach proof. So when we started this, Paris hadn't been negotiated. And as we are today, we're following this route of CO2 emissions that takes us from this RCP 8.5 pathway. I think sometimes we need to remember that we're still above that pathway. Even though all the talk is going on, we are still tracking along that blue line with emissions and eating the, the, the blue lines that we see here. Okay. The other pathway we wanted to investigate was RCP 4.5. At the time, that looked like the best we could ever achieve, yes, because people were buying into the fact that we needed to do something. So RCP 4.5 reduces CO2 emissions Okay, somewhere around uh, 2016, we start pulling it back. Okay. As I've mentioned, putting CO2 up in the atmosphere has two effects. It increases the CO2 concentration in the oceans, creating precipitation. We know that it is 1999 paper, we talked about doubling CO2 in the atmosphere. It's important to realize that RCP 8.5, by the end of the century, is basically doing much more than doubling, it's taking it pretty close to a thousand BPM. Yes? And that keeps climbing and doesn't stop climbing. Sometimes when I think we talk about these windows, we talk to behave as though the world stops in 2100 and we don't worry about what's going to happen afterwards. So at least our CP 8.5 has it flattening not. When I look at the two, okay, RCP 4.5 occurs in 2050 if we don't come forth with this as usual. 2050 is 35 years away from now, which is not a better guess than that now. But the window of opportunity is becoming much uh, smaller. Okay? And then we have our temperature impact. So we know, here I'm working above present day, because we use present day baseline. So we have two degrees by the end of the century for us to be 4.5 and 4 degrees for 8.5. So we found the reef. We work a lot with Heron Island in the Southern Great Barrier um, um, Reef. We have a beautiful reef there. 
And it started to warm and bleach now. I hope it's not been destroyed, but it was looking absolutely amazing for the present day. The other nice thing about Heron Island, unlike here, we have a big seasonal profile, you know? So on the top here, you have the temperature profile. So in the summer, we're up around 26, almost 27 degrees. And in the winter, we've got down to 20, 22 degrees. And for experiments, when you want to keep things in the future, but you don't want to do a bucket experiment where you drop them into hot water, yes? That's, when we do experiments on heating, that's the one of the biggest criticisms we've got. We need to be too fast. Okay. What we can actually do at this location is we can start heating the four degrees, okay, around April, finish heating in August, and we haven't heated our system at all, relatively speaking. We just kept it at the same temperature. Nice you can also see that even the PCO2 has a winter summer uh, 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 a dynamic at Heron Island. Yes? It's by about 100 ppm more CO2 in the summer when everything's respiring a lot more, I suspect, and less in the winter. So we took this reef. I would have loved to have put the whole reef in an experimental system. I have to pick little bits of it, yeah? And so we made basically four buckets to replicate. And then we have these sumps which are up front where we treat the PCO2 and we treat the temperature. And what we decided to do in our very first experiment is not to tease apart temperature and PCO2. I know that's the most unscientific thing to do. You all think we want to know what the individual effects of temperature and PCO2 were. But we wanted to nail what happens to the leaf both of these evolve as they're supposed to evolve. You know, that was the most important question as far as we were concerned to get over to the general public and other people in an experimental centre. So our, our, the three treatments I'm going to show you are the red one, which is RCPA 0.5, the yellow one, which is 4.5, and then there's the present day one. So what happens on the season platform? And I've just drawn the lines for um, and then, then essentially the temperature, and I did the same thing with the CO2, okay, the long term, so you can see what happens. So according to the bleaching hypothesis here, when do we start going above the NMN? Well, we start going above somewhere in October, on uh, October, November, under RCPA 8.5, which is delayed by about two months under 4.5, just to investigate those things. Our experiments, we didn't just want to, we take three months to acclimate our tanks. We wanted long-term experiments to actually see what happens to net classification rates. So they ran for another year and a half after we had acclimated them. So we go through a number of springs, a number of summers, one fall, okay, so we get seasonal dynamics. So we can look for recovery, okay? It's an open water system, it's not a recirculating system, so things can settle and grow in our tanks okay, through the pores. So we have a rejuvenation potential in our tanks as well. So I'm going to begin by showing you what happens in the control tanks. So all our tanks are set up the same way. We put different poles, seven different types. Okay? And then these shots are changing every month. And what you notice, I hope, is how this dating on different rows, yes? These things grew by 300% over the course of our experiment under these conditions. If you looked at the, if I can play it again, if you look at these branching and properties, you'll see them also grow. And if you look around the tanks, the still holes grow. We get a little bit of a node one of algae at the end, and that's probably because the amount of um, uh, Alpha we had in this experiment weren't as high as they should be, which ones we increased them. But you, know, you can see the growth, it's pretty good. There's a variety of branching varieties, you can see it growing. The style of the Slata is really huge as well. Let's look at what happens under RCP uh, 4.5. I want you to look in particular at what happens to the plate in the copper, which reaches, yes. Then we get two types of poles that come back, winter hits, okay. So we see them recover, okay. So we've got the fungia that are recovering, and we've got the grain poles that recover. Okay? Those were our 
principal survivors. Okay, those were all that survived under it. So one of the underlying questions there is did they grow or didn't they grow? Okay, so keep that in mind. So next, what we've done is we've taken our temperatures and we've got to determine what DHW was for the tank. So this is basically how hot did it get? These are the leaching alerts that NOAA sends out. And when did they leach? So in RCP 4.5, you can see that the poles leached um, in uh, the first January. Okay, then we got huge mortality as we went up to DHWs above the red line, which is eight, as predicted. Okay, the poles two types that survived: the grain and the little single pollen fungi came back alive as we came down the slopes as it got cooler. And then the subsequent summer, what we found is that the bleaching occurred and it was a little bit delayed. In fact, that arrow has been shifted over when we stretched it out. That arrow shouldn't be back in March, it should be um, a little bit later in January. Our arrows shifted around a bit. Okay? But it was a little bit delayed on what had happened before. So one of the questions is, why did they not why did they take longer to reach in the second time around? Yeah? Is this what everybody says is adaptation? Yes, they reach once and now they become harder and they're going to take more. Or is it to do with the light levels they've got? Or is perhaps reaching a good thing and they're not doing it any longer? And I'm throwing that one out there because I want to demonstrate something to you. Next, we're going to look at RCP 8.5. So this is the sad reef, okay? And basically what happens is everything dies. But notice, did you see what bleached first in this treatment? Okay, so you see algal. It's a fight between Pilerpa and cyanobacteria. Pilerpa wins in winter, the cyanobacteria seem to win in summer. So this is what our reef looked like at the end of time, okay? And, and um, there was no recovery. It looks like there are no poles in there, but there are actually a few poles in here. Okay? When you look at that picture, one of the surprising features for me is our two surviving species of pole, the grey pole and the Gerundia, were the first to be in the region. So our still poor party ones were the first to be. All the others have a part from the front of the pole feature. Die so quickly, relatively hardy. Right? It's not what we tend to think of, we tend to think of you die. But here is you didn't reach, die first. Right? Which I think is important to realise. The mortality was extraordinary, okay, and it's as you expected, as the DHWs that did above the um, uh, DHW of eight, we started to see lots of mortality. The amount of time they're above the HW rate becomes a larger and larger proportion of the year, which is what we predicted for But surprisingly, not all corals did die. So that's Aptasia out there. It was as a belly to Aptasia. We had certain belly in the last summer. It was doing very well. So I want to question how to model the coral that is, because it's a, a single product, doesn't have calcium carbonate inside it. But we had hundreds of them in all our tanks. They were just everywhere at the end of the experiment. So it's hard for them to spread. What about the calcification rates? Okay. So on the front here, I've got just the pictures of the leaves as they started out, and the pictures of the leaves as they ended up for the present day at the top, the RCP 4.5 in the middle, and then the red ones are RCP 8.5. When we measure classification for a reef, okay, the way we do it is using alkalinity, we look at changes in alkalinity. Okay, so that enables us to see what happens at different times of the day. So what I've plotted up here is the average classification rate for the present day, at midday and at midnight. Okay? And the one thing you should notice at the top there, the tank classification rates. They went out between RCP 4.5 4 and 8.5. And we had corals growing in 4.5, at least two species. We had no hard corals growing in 8.5, but we get the same classification rate. Where we really get the difference is at night. And at 
you know it when you start to see strong declassification okay, come in. When we look at pole specific growth, so this is where we put them in a bucket and we measure the weight change in the skeleton to see how much skeleton has been deposited. What you can see here again is we get large percent growth over the period of time in the present day experiment, but under either of the two future ones, it's pretty minimal, okay? close to nothing. What happened to our party poles? Okay. What did they do in classification? When they are finishing, <coughs> they're coming back and then finishing again, do they classify through that process? Okay. And what you can see, I've divided this into two different time frames. I've gone from the beginning of the experiment, which is the first winter, through to the end of the first summer. And now I've gone from the first summer to the second summer. And what you can see is, Things grow before we hit the summer period in all the tanks, until it starts to get too extreme, and then they start to increase them. But when you go from one summer to the next summer, you get no growth in this hole. Despite the fact that they are alive, yeah? essentially. So the conclusions, when we looked at the experiment, is that we know tend to be large polyps, they're clearly things that have that capability to be in, yes? So the brain poles, uh, the fungi, which is just one giant polyp, does really well, okay? RCP 4.5 wasn't much better than 8.5, which for me is a very alarming statement, because that's 35 years away or longer kind of trajectory, okay? So the roofs themselves are actually going into net decalcification, okay? Overmaking storms and cyclones. Okay, there are tanks, they have a wave maker in them, but they don't have cyclones spinning through them. If you have no growth, you have a cyclone spinning, your reef disappears. Your reef is the building block for everything. It's your coastal protection, it's everything, it's, it's quite worrying. The other thing, that the ambient experimental baseline, the region line and then is really important. That's what I just you know a baseline is fundamental. So when you do a small experiment, you can do it in winter if you hit by two, you might not even be taking them up to a temperature which is threatening. You need to think about that baseline level when you're doing your experiments. So the next experiment we did, we became a bit more scientific and we wanted to know how the temperature and acidification affect the reefs independently. And so we teased them apart, we just worked on RCP 8.5. So we have a present day system where the temperature and the CO2 or acidification levels are as they are now. And then we have one in which we're heating it but we're not changing the acidification level. One where um, it's, we're changing the acidification level but not heating. And one where we're giving them the double whammy. Yeah? So the blue ones and red ones are essentially repeats of what we've done before. So for this, we added a few more herbivores. Okay, this is a gardening dance of fish went into our tanks to try and mow down some of our other little issues. I've got December 2014 on one end and March at the end of the experiment for the present day. What was nice about this experiment, it also allowed us to see the seasonal cycle that we naturally witness in calcification for reefs. Yes, for southern latitude reefs, they classify well in the summer, but not so well in the winter. Important cycle to appreciate. When we came to looking at simplification only, okay, we think, oh wow, this is fabulous for these because we've got all this classification occurring at the end of the experiment. But if you look up at the picture of, on the top at the end of the experiment, all that green stuff is halamida. Yes? I saw a lot of halamida on raw reefs at the moment, especially down at 30 meters, there were a lot of halamida. It's a great calcifier, but it's not a great reef builder. Right? So we saw that signal take over. Temperature only, you get this very depressed season cycle. Yes, the poles that survive, we keep calcifying when the time comes back to the time on the temperature only. The double whammy is we grow, we grow, we're dead. 
um, that Paris had adopted the idea that we would, would um, keep climate, average climate um, surface temperatures uh, below, average global temperatures below 2 degrees uh, in the short term and 1.5 in the long term. That penny that dropped was that, well, that's going to be the future. So how do we respond as a community of people that care about fisheries, about coral reefs, and so on, to that plan? And so step one is that we've got to get to Paris. And Paris is often referred to within the climate modeling community as RCP 2.6. It's a very low amount of heating. The key feature of it is that about 2050, we stabilize ocean temperature, you know, the amount of CO2 going into the ocean, and so on, stabilizes. Because once you've got stability, then nature can catch up. So the second part of this is, okay, well, what do we do while we're waiting for stability? What can we usefully do? And that comes down to actually identifying those reefs that are most likely to get through, that are in places of the world where maybe it's not heating as quickly and so on, and to deal with any local factors or whatever to preserve those areas going forward. We also need to represent biodiversity. We also want to make sure that these reef systems are connected. So the second part of the plan is to literally go through a optimization process where we identify what reefs are, have got the best characteristics for surviving. Now this is not meaning that we give up work on all other coral reefs and only focus on those 50. This is in addition to. And so if you do that, and you're aiming for that horizon. If we can preserve enough coral reefs going forward so that in the mid part of this century, under stabilization, coral reefs will then start to grow again on coral reefs. And what's really nice about this, and unfortunately I probably won't be there, um, and you guys will, um, is that instead of reading science papers that, that are depressing, you know, another coral reef disappears, We'll get all these articles from the open science and they'll say, coral reefs are now flourishing off Florida. You know, haven't been seen all the It'll be a very happy world. So um, that's a bit of optimism. But here's, here's, an ex here's an example of the data set. And so we've actually got support from three major philanthropists to go forward with this. We're in the first phase of this uh, project. But here's an example of the difference in climate threat across the oceans. This is the total heat stress. Right, measured relative to NMN from 1981 to 2010. And here is the sort of average total monthly anomalies you, anomalies you get. And you can see that the equatorial Pacific and places like the Solomon Islands look like they are in oceans, in parts of the ocean that are heating very quickly. So they'd be not where you want to put your, your investment in this particular case. On the other hand, if you look at the coral triangle, um, and even off the Maldives and so on, actually the average rate of heating there is, 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 is much lower. So this is just an early sort of data set, right? There's a lot more work that's going into this. But there is clearly opportunities for making decisions about where you might protect reefs that will become the seed of tomorrow. Now once you know those reef sites exist, and you know they're important to climate, then you could start to work on perhaps the local threats to increase the resilience. For example, if this were, and this is just taken from the National Geographic, I don't know where it is, but anyway, it's a coastal you know, situation. But let's imagine that there was a really important uh, climate uh, coral reef or refuge just beyond that, that photograph, right? Then we really value fixing up the water quality coming out of that, that coastal town. And now that's very simplistic, and we haven't gone through the process, and we're going to over this year form a list of 50 reefs at least that have the best prospects for becoming those seed centers of the future. It also gives hope for restoration. At the moment, restoration doesn't work, right? We go out with black corals and then the next big leaching then comes through and kills them off. That's why I made in Hawaii late last year was always disappointed agriculturalists who across all their corals. And, but, but getting those technologies down and making them really work is going to be important because 30 or 40 years from now, we're going to want to use those to read seam reef systems, to really understand what robust corals are all about. So this is very provocative. I get a lot of hate mail over this. <laughs> Not hate mail, but you know, robust discussion. 
Um, but I think it's got some really interesting possibilities, and it's certainly taken the attention of um, of uh, the Bloomberg philanthropists, uh, the faulty Alan Bannon, co co-inventor of Microsoft, and the Tiffany uh, and Co Foundation. And here is just a little finishing video, just to, so uh, you can see what concept we're thinking about here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you decide on these 50 reads area, are you predominantly using temperature as your main thing? So if you have an area that's sort of had was expected to warm by quite a moderate amount, but then lots of other factors are going on there, say so really huge overfishing and huge pollution, how do you how are you planning to? Yeah, this is, that's a very important question. So you could just simply go on temperature alone or climate threat and end up with impossible, you know, things. That for example, um, coral reefs in Jakarta Bay mm. near this big mega city. Um, you might have the ideal conditions in terms of heating, but the number of threats and the chance of overturning those threats would be you know, a monstrous task. So we've got a separate conservation group. Uh, as we come up with this, so there's 12 people at a meeting uh, going through this process. That list is then going to be discussed with conservation practitioners to put the lens of, of, of what's possible. So there's a, there's a two-part process here. The, the first step has to be scientific. We can't really say the work here, so therefore we should do it. It's got to have this rule of put over it to say, this is a region which has a really good chance of surviving climate change. It's got all the right characteristics of being able to receive future reads. So therefore, it's in the bag. Then we take it over here and say, OK, yeah, is that possible? And if not, we'll then move to the next so this list for, for, uh, um, for your information is likely to have you know, prioritised to 150 or 200 or even more. And there's no reason why if we're successful and start projects in those regions that it shouldn't be expanded. Right? It's not a 50 of that's it for us left the station. So yes, it's a very important uh, consideration. Yeah, and, sorry, can I ask you? Yeah, Are you planning on making these areas marine reserves or really kept areas, or is it kind of just trying to minimise the threats in that area? I, I think it will, on each particular situation, will be consideration of the sort of technologies that, or the approaches that might work, uh, and they will differ from place to place. It's all about partnerships and collaboration. Um, so in some places that will work, other places it probably is yeah, something else. But you're right. What's your number? Vivian. Vivian, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, do you have my for me? <laughs> 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 one sec. So I've got two questions, one for each of you. Sure. Um, one, the first one for all. When, when you talk about 50 reefs, what's the scale of the reef that you're talking about? That's um, actually the number one um, question that has to be solved first up. Okay. Um, it may be that it's variable. And it depends on the manageable unit size. You know, it may be that, for example, the Capricorn Bunker Group is 13 islands that are in um, sort of communication and connected and so on for the rest of the week. That might be an example, but it could be, for example, that it's um, 10 kilometers of the coastline is particularly rich. So that we're leaving that to the experts to go through that process to say, well, what are we dealing with? Is it a, is it a hexagon on the map or is it a functional unit? Right? Personally, I think it should be probably uh, some unit that has integrity in itself. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, for Sophie, so you mentioned that um, so large polyps, corals, uh, hot corals are the ones that have a lot of polyps. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we've also done that with Fungia and with the green corals. But what about the Bryson, uh, Lobata, um, and uh, let's say Fabula? Well, we, we they've got very, very small polyps, and they're also very small. Yeah, but uh, we've got one branching variety which seems to be bulletproof on our reef flag in the system. And that had variable responses. So it wasn't as consistently a winner as, as other calls. It also had very weird properties. I, 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 I mean, we don't have the numbers to do this, but some of the, the our branching varieties were buried in the sediment. 
it looked bleached on the top and we'd pull it up and it was perfectly pigmented. So it was, you know, our, perhaps our varieties is a little bit weird, but varieties does do well. Um, you know, especially the massive varieties. The massive varieties. The question is how well they do over the long term, you know? Um, at the moment, if you're taking a bleaching event that's happening out here, it might last four weeks or, you know, even eight weeks and it goes away. You know, when you push the future, the bleaching events go for a very long period of time. And so what we're finding is that those poles, I, I think it's those that bleach and then can feed themselves, they actually sustain themselves bleach. So some of our poles will bleach for, eight months and still come out the other end as winners under 4.5. Under 8.5, none of them, well, plenty of them relatively well, a couple of them, but, you know, uh, so I think that ability to feed becomes essential when you're bone white and you have no good belly So I question whether varieties would actually survive to that stretch of time. So you predict that varieties massive may actually not might not, might not. You know, we, I mean, I had a couple of varieties that survived, but not enough really to give them that check mark of, you know, being resilient. Okay. Oh, that's I mean, that's the first time I've actually heard that. Yeah, I think it depends how long you do your experiments for. You know, that, that's the, the key issue. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. You know, I understand there are a lot of uh, UNESCO main and wide scale reserves. Presumably, they occur on historic areas as well. We have one, and government is trying to declare the whole Maldives as a uh, full wide scale reserve. And certainly, these areas, they would have core areas, which presumably would have threatened those considerations, and which presumably represent those areas where they have a lot of healthy you know, frogs and fish like etc. Mm -hmm. So don't you, do you not think you would be wasting your resources? Would you not be helping to kind of uh, put your resources into these areas, making them stronger, making them more, you know, stronger management, etc. Um, instead of those? Yeah, uh, yeah. this is a really good uh, question, Tim. It really is. Um, it's really the criteria which you make the decision. So. Um, Ideally, what you'd hope is that the Biosphere region was also a region where there was low grades of heating, that there was a good track record of, you know, uh, being surviving in certain other areas. Uh, but unless you start the process thinking about it independently, you won't really know whether that's the case. Because I think what we're learning is that um, no matter how you protect the system or reclassify it in the face of climate change, you know, you can have your beautiful World Heritage Area in Australia and end up almost on the endangered list uh, from Heritage. I know we've heard of the big debates going on in Australia and in Paris and so on. Uh, but if you have lost one of your, you know, uh, four corals in the Great Barrier Reef, is it time to say it's in danger? So, yeah, it's, um, I think the only way to get at this is to run the process and see what we, we see. Uh, and hopefully, and I mean this sincerely, I hope that the Maldives you know, is really high on the list, which will then, I think, aid with its, its, um, its argument to become um, a world of you know, biosphere. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just, I just want to thank the Maldives National University for for hosting this, and then also the MRC for the collaboration on research and the Ministry of Environment and Energy for leadership on this project, and a few words now from the